out of his win in South Carolina, former President Trump spoke at the Black Conservative Federation annual gala on Friday. And here is some of what he told the audience. These lights are so bright in my eyes that I can't see too many people out there. But uh, I can only see the black ones. I can't see any white ones, you see. That's how far I've come. That's how far I've come. I got indicted for nothing, for something that is nothing. They were doing it because it's election interference. And then I got indicted a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And a lot of people said that that's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. It's, it's been pretty amazing. I'm being indicted for you, the American people. I'm being indicted for you, the black population. My, the mugshot, we've all seen the mugshot. And you know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts and they sell them for $19 a piece. It's pretty amazing. Millions. By the way, millions of these things have been sold. Yeah, so, uh, Rev, um, oh, yeah. My I'm, God. Uh, Curious, Rev. Um, do you, do you, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose we could do a poll of black Americans and ask whether they are more likely to support somebody because they stole nuclear secrets from the White House. They stole secret war plans against Iran. They lied to the FBI about having those nuclear secrets and secret war plans, lied to the FBI and the Justice Department about having classified documents hidden in their uh, beach beachfront resort. I mean, maybe black Americans relate to that. I don't know. I wouldn't think they would. Do they relate to Trump telling his IT director to destroy all the evidence? Uh, another IT director testifying against him or to maintenance people to flood uh, the room where the IT department is to destroy all. I just don't know. I just, I, I, boy, it does seem like a stretch, doesn't it, Rev, to think that Donald Trump doing all of that and illegally paying off a porn star, according to the Man Manhattan DA, and trying to foment a riot uh, on January the 6th. I, I, I'm not so sure, Rev. Help me understand what, why would... Black What's Americans relate to Donald Trump there. I don't understand the connection. Well, first of all, let, let's be clear. Donald Trump is using the stereotype of blacks being criminals, and therefore we would g gravitate towards somebody in a mugshot. Uh, he's in a mugshot for trying to interfere with an election. Blacks were arrested to get the right to vote. That's what the marches were about. It is the epitome of an insult also when you think of the fact that it is a black man that is prosecuting him in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, a black woman in Georgia, a black woman, the New York State Attorney General, Letitia James. So he's saying that black people would relate to someone indicted for trying to undermine the elections by blacks, but we would go with him rather than them. The, the other part of this that is so amazing is Donald Trump himself has been part of these kinds of uh, unfair prosecutions of blacks. It was he that took out ads in newspapers calling for the death penalty of five young black and brown boys of raping a white woman in Central Park who went to jail falsely. It was later proven they didn't do it because of DNA. Donald Trump said no, punished them anyway. So all of a sudden, I've been in this movement for 40, 50 years. I've never yeah. seen him stand up for blacks that were treated wrong by the criminal justice system. But now he's a symbol of being persecuted. Uh, he's being persecuted by black prosecutors, a black woman judge in uh, the federal court in Washington, D.C. And any shameless blacks that are standing there applauding him needs to check the facts. Well, and, and yeah. Mika... He is also making racist comments against Letitia James, against Fonnie Willis, against uh, those prosecutors that happen to be uh, uh, people of color just because they're black.
He, yep. he yeah, I, I guess he didn't. Maybe they didn't fit that into his speech. <sighs> Listen, first it was Navalny. And now uh, it's the African-American community. Um, it's, these comparisons are sick and grotesque. Uh, Biden-Harris campaign co-chair, former Congressman Cedric Richmond, responded in a statement, quote, Donald Trump claiming that black Americans will support him because of his criminal charges is insulting, it's moronic, and it's just plain racist. He thinks black voters are so uninformed that we won't see through his shameless pandering Ring. He has another thing coming. So, John Heilman, um, I just, you know, then there's uh, Tim Scott. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's very, on the Republican side, the, the Trump acolytes, those that just stay with him through anything, it's beyond hard to watch. How do you think the overall black community will respond to this remember his comments the first time around what do you have to lose i mean honestly mika i don't think most of the most black voters are paying attention to the race at this point and i don't think they're going to respond to this in particular in any way but i would say that if you think about you know the things that people talk about as being uh, correctly think about uh, what are the concerns that the biden campaign has going into a general election against donald trump it's the it's not so much these head-to-head -head polls it's that they've seen their support among certain core constituencies slip, including non-white voters, dramatically. And, and, and at the core of that is, is a lot of black voters. And the Biden campaign comes back and says, hey, wait until the, yeah. the race is, clear, is clear, clear that Donald Trump is the nominee. When we get to the fall and it's this binary choice between the two. The African-American community in America is going to remember that Donald Trump is an existential threat and they are going to come home to us. We have a lot of work to do, but they're going to come mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. These kinds of comments not these comments specifically, but the fact that Donald Trump will make this kind of comment. He's made these kind of comments for years, as Reb points out. He will make them into the, fu into the future because this is who Donald Trump is. I only see black faces. Look at how far I've come. Ha, ha, ha. That is the kind of thing that Trump will say, has been, has been saying it for a long time. We'll keep saying it. And that is why the Biden campaign is right. Uh, there's a, they have at least something to cling to there when they say, hey, you know, when people start to focus on this race, our core constituencies will come back because they'll remember who Donald Trump is. And he'll be in front of them showing them who he is day after day after day. This is kind of a preview of the kind of thing they're counting on in the fall to bring African-American voters back to Joe Biden and with the kind of intensity they had back in 2016 and in, or sorry, back in 2020. Yeah, a Trump mm -hmm. advisor told me and made this same argument that the indictments would make black voters go for Trump, that the mugshot would make black voters go for Trump. Went on to add that the new line of Trump sneakers would appeal to black voters oh, and would make no, them go on God. to try, which, of course, we can all uh, leave that aside just how grossly offensive uh, that is. So, Matt Lewis, let's just get give especially you, with those sneakers. Well, yeah, it also insults. I mean, my God, they're yeah. just the worst. Um, Matt Lewis, let's let's give you the final word here on on this particular moment. It's true. T T Hammond's right uh, in that the Republicans and, and Trump in particular think they've made inroads with black voters, although he may have just hurt himself with these comments. Uh, it is an area of concern for Democrats. They know they have to work hard to get them back. And the, their constituencies are saying, hey, don't take us for granted. How do you see this dynamic playing out as November approaches? Well, to me, what's so interesting about this is, first of all, uh, this is almost trickled down, right? So, like, Donald Trump didn't come up with the bogus I'm Navalny, even though he unveiled it at CPAC last week. He didn't come up with that. That came from Dinesh D'Souza, Lee Zeldin. Oh. Similarly, the, this God. racist notion that the mugshot would make Trump popular with African-Americans, that's like a year and a half old. I think it came from like Dinesh D'Souza and, and Laura Loomer, kind of fringe right-wing activist types. Trump then, at, a, at some point, it gets to him. And, you know, there's an old expression in politics, hang a lantern on your problem. How do you put, how do you make uh, a mugshot into a positive? How do you make the fact that you've been supporting Putin for all of these years and his opposition leader was just poisoned or not, he was poisoned, then went to jail, died in jail. H how do you put a happy face on that if you're Donald Trump? Uh, their ability to come up with these bizarrely, devious, in some cases, almost evil, brilliant, but uh, also entirely flawed, obviously, and bogus uh, excuses is, is pretty unparalleled. I can't believe the audacity of doing it. Uh, some of them, I think, are better than others. But I, look, I imagine that there's someone out there in middle America right now who's not paying that close of attention to politics 
who now thinks, oh, yeah, Trump is just like Navalny. He's the victim. <laughs> right. He's casting himself yeah. as the victim once again. Mm -hmm. uh, if nothing else, it's, it's impressive that he, that he keeps trying. Hey, look, welcome to the end of democracy. <laughs> we are here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th, but we will, we, we will endeavor to, oh, forget, oh, to get rid oh. of it and replace it with, with this right here. We'll replace it with this right, all right. here. Amen. That's right, because all glory, all glory is not to government, all glory to God. If I were the uh, Biden campaign, I would pay to have every American see the yes. CPAC convention, because the thing that has been thwarting Republicans uh, in the midterms and since has been this impression of the Republican Party as an extreme party. Yesterday, you had someone stand up at the CPAC convention as speaker and basically talk about we're going to we, we, we start we almost toppled democracy on January 6th. We're going to do it now with this. And he held up a cross basically advocating for theocracy. Uh, this is not the image that the Republican Party wants. Yeah, former advisor David Axelrod with that message to the Biden campaign after a far-right activist told attendees at CPAC his goal is to overthrow democracy and finish the mission of January 6th, which was met with glee. So, Reverend Al, if we've learned anything from uh, the Trump era, is to believe is to believe our ears and eyes um, that CPAC, you know, you can say what you want. And but at the same time, these are the very people who are pushing Trumpism into the future. They're pushing Trumpism into the future and they're saying it like they're being patriotic when in fact they're being the opposite. Yeah. Uh, the, when you see them using uh, the Bible in a distorted way, but even if they were using it in an actual way, that is against what the country was uh, was founded on, freedom of religion. So if you have a theocracy, you can't have a democracy. And they're openly advocating that. I'm in London, England today. They fought the British for freedom of religion. Now they're saying we want women to have to go by our interpretation of the Bible. We want others to go by that. This is anti-American, and it needs to be called out that way. You yeah. cannot celebrate the American Revolution and then advocate a theocracy. This is not a drill. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rev, for that. A new and as we barrel toward a uh, likely rematch of the 2020 election, one candidate continues to have a hold over white rural voters. But it's not Joe Biden, seen here as a boy on the right side of your screen who went to public school, is the son of a used car salesman, and was born to a middle-class family in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Instead... It is Trump here on the left side, a private school educated son of a New York City real estate tycoon who became a millionaire at eight years old and didn't have to serve because he claimed he had bone spurs in his little feet. So why is it that Trump appeals so much to a group he couldn't be more different from? Joining us now, Professor of Political Science at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Tom Schaller, and journalist and opinion writer Paul Waldman. Their new book, Out Tomorrow, is entitled White Rural Rage, The Threat to American Democracy. And Tom, we'll start with you. Uh, why are white rural voters a threat to democracy at this point? You would think, as we pointed out, looking at Joe Biden's background and Donald Trump's, that, that the opposite would be true. I mean, we lay out the fourfold interconnected threat that white rural voters pose to the country. First of all, and we show 30 polls and national studies to demonstrate this. So we provide the receipts in Chapter 6. They're the most racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, anti-gay geodemographic group in the country. Second, they're the most conspiracist group. QAnon support and subscribers, election denialism, COVID denialism and scientific skepticism, Obama birtherism. Third, anti-democratic sentiments. They don't believe in an independent press, free speech. They're most likely to say the president should be able to act unilaterally without any checks from Congress or the courts or the bureaucracy. They're also the most strongly white nationalist and white Christian nationalist. And fourth, they are most likely to excuse or justify violence as an acceptable alternative to peaceful public discourse. So you mentioned a lot of negative factors <laughs> about, about this, this demographic. Um, Tom, what else do they have in common? Uh, with, well, 
you know, I think that the what what really matters I mean, at this point in time. What makes them vulnerable? Oh, well, a lot of that has to do with, uh, as a starting point, the problems that rural America has, which are very real and very profound. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, the more uh, problematic uh, education systems. They have right. poor infrastructure. They've had a, a lack of economic opportunity. We've seen a lot of manufacturing jobs leave from rural areas. And mm -hmm. that kind of left them open to someone like Donald Trump who would come along and tell them something that was true, that there is a system that has not served them well. Mm -hmm. And he said... They're pissed I'm, off. They are pissed off, and they have some reason to be mm -hmm. with both parties. Um, the, the trouble is that what Donald Trump uh, gave them was not something that was actually going to fix those problems, but was just a, a, a kind of a, a way to channel their rage and anger. And, you know, we've been told for so long, especially Democrats have been told, that in order to get rural voters, to get them to listen to you, you have to go there, you have to really empathize right. with them, you have to show them that you understand their lives, you have to, you know, put on a Carhartt jacket and go right, down to somebody's right. farm. Have a and, beer. And yeah, maybe yeah. milk a cow. Yes. <laughs> and it yes. turned out that none of that was true. No. When Donald Trump came along, he didn't do any of that stuff. He was just a conduit for their rage, their anger, their resentment. And that turned out to be what they wanted. And it wasn't really about the material uh, conditions of their lives, because he right. didn't improve their lives. But he got more support in rural areas in 2020 than he had in 2016, despite the fact that none of their problems had gotten any better under him. All that he gave them was a way to essentially give a big middle finger to yeah. Democrats, to people who live in cities, and to the rest of the country. Isn't he more than a conduit to their rage? Isn't he also... Um, a symbol of their aspirations to an extent? They are, but what are their aspirations? As we to write the rich. book, I guess, but they're not getting there, right? Poverty is soaring in between 20. And why aren't they seeing that? I think this is the disconnect, right? They'd rather channel their rage. I think what a lot uh, of rural white Americans have decided is that their economic fortunes are decided by globalization and, frankly, late-stage capitalism, which is eating up all the mom-and-pop stores and taking away, you know, the uh, the extractive industries and coal and farming and so forth. So they might as well vote on their cultural issues. They might as well vote on God's God, gun, and religion because they feel like neither party is going to deliver any material benefit. They're not going to reverse the closure of rural pharmacies and rural hospitals and rural health care treatment so facilities, which are now disappearing, not because of communism and not because of socialism, but because of capitalism, right? Rural pharmacies and hospitals are closing because they're not money makers, and unless they're part of a regional chain, they're disappearing. So Trump comes in and says, let's just hate on cities, let's yeah. just hate on minorities, let's hate on immigrants, and at least they can deliver on that, and so they're not even voting in their material interests anymore, and that's causing a further decay and decline of rural communities. All right, uh, Reverend Al Guys has a question for you. Rev? Tom, Tom, wouldn't you also say that uh, it is in the interest of those like Donald Trump to put the blame on people who are likely to be going through the same kinds of challenges in maybe a different part of the country, like blacks, like browns, like migrants? And he channels this rage that they rightfully have in rural areas toward the wrong people and those that can do something about it escape without having to make change because if those rural whites and blacks and migrants and browns came together, they could really force real change. Isn't it a diversion uh, to the wrong people based on their inherent racism and xenophobia? Absolutely, Reverend Allen. As you probably know, 24% of rural America is non-white now. And we have had right. eight years since Trump came down the escalator in June 2015 of focusing on rural whites, the heartland flyover people, and what their economic anxieties are. But with the exception of two things that we've, we can find, opioid deaths and gun deaths, on every other measure in rural America, rural Latinos, rural African Americans, and yeah. rural Native Americans, the most rural population in America, are doing worse. And nobody cares about their economic anxieties. And one of the things we argue for, and Paul Ar argues eloquently in our concluding chapter, is that if rural America really wants to revive itself, they need to build a pan-racial, white, non-white coalition in rural America. But there doesn't seem to be any effort whatsoever among white rural Americans to do that. Wow. Now, we have a whole chapter about non-white rural Americans, because they're a population that totally gets ignored. You know, we spent... Uh, a couple of years after Donald Trump got elected, you know, journalists went to every single diner in middle America to try to talk to red-hatted MAGA right. folks about what, what concerned them, what they were mad about. Nobody went to the rural African Americans, rural right. Latinos, rural Native Americans to find out what's mad, what they're mad about. And they have every reason to be mad, but you know what they're not doing? They're not 
overrunning the Capitol. They're not going down to their state capital car just, carrying AR-15. So they have, to me. And, and nobody <laughs> treats them the way we do right world Americans, as though yeah. they, we have a moral obligation to know what they're angry about and to cater to them. So. But, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, the book is White Roll Rage. You can find out more in it. The Threat to American Democracy. Authors Tom Schaller and Paul Waldman. Thank you both very much. We really appreciate it. I got for nothing, for something that is nothing. They were doing it because it's election interference. I stand before you today not only as your past and hopefully future president, but as a proud political dissident, I am a dissident. November 5th will be our new Liberation Day, but for the liars and cheaters and fraudsters and censors and imposters who have commandeered our government, it will be their judgment day. Their judgment day. That was former President Trump campaigning over the weekend, once again blaming the numerous indictments against him as an attempt by Democrats to sabotage his re-election campaign. That argument seems ridiculous at first, but when it's parroted by officials over and over again, it becomes more believable in the eyes of voters. A new poll this month shows nearly three-fourths of Republicans now agree the federal election interference case against Trump is being conducted unfairly. The rise of disinformation, especially in politics, has become one of the biggest threats to free and fair elections. The new book from former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid, Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America, explains how it's done and what to do to stop it. I don't know if it can be stopped at the rate we're going, Barbara, so I can't wait to hear about this. Um, I mean, you saw right there, just over and over again, Donald Trump either um, exaggerating things or lying flat out. And we know it reverberates across many TV networks and websites completely um, not answered to with the truth or not pushed back upon. And it just lives out there, those lies. How do you, how does one in America counter disinformation so that voters get the truth. So, Mika, one of the things I talk about in the book is how uh, people are choosing tribe over truth. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter so much what the statement is. What matters is who says it. And so uh, what Donald Trump and others have done is to so demonize their opponents and, and create the impression that there are only two sides to every issue, that uh, I'm on the side of good and my opponent is on the side of evil. I have so demonized them that you shouldn't believe anything they say and that all of these uh, allegations against me are fake news. It's all um, you know, right. just an effort to uh, interfere with the election and other kinds of things. So what can we do about that? Well, there are a number of things we can do. I think at the government level, there are things we can do, for example, with regulation of social media, which has been allowed to grow in some ways wonderfully. There's been a lot of innovation in tech, but we have allowed things like anonymous accounts, uh, like bots to amplify uh, messages that may be not very popular but appear to be garnering likes and shares. Uh, we allow algorithms to push us toward content that outrages us. So that is one thing I think that we need to cover at the governmental level. Uh, I think we need to reform the way we do campaign finance. After the Citizens United case, there is all kinds of dark money in our system, and the people who have the power are benefiting from that, and so it's difficult to make headway there. But I think there are also things we can do at an individual level. Number one, we have to have uh, the discipline ourselves to try to figure out what is truth and what is false. One of the things that uh, disinformers do is to uh, create an illusion that truth doesn't matter. Truth is for suckers. Uh, people become cynical and then numb and then they disengage altogether from politics. We need to take responsibility for ourselves to make sure that we are learning the truth and we can do that with fact checking websites and by turning to media uh, that is credible, things like factcheck.org and Snopes and other organizations that work to debunk false claims online. You know, uh, Barbara, this is, this is, Barbara, this is such an important book.
come out right now. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this, writing this book, and thank you for being with us today. I, I, I wanna, let's, let's blow up a myth here that it's just rubes, uh, uh, you know, in some far away place, uh, away from media outlets, uh, mainstream media outlets that are believing this, uh, because it's not. It's highly educated people uh, with advanced degrees uh, repeat a lot of these lies. I have two friends of mine uh, who will say, "Oh, I, well, one said, oh, I don't, I don't look at the news anymore uh, because it's just so hard to figure out who's telling the truth." And yet she goes on, you know, every every trash website out there is spreading spreading these lies. And the second thing is, is you know, I, I had another friend that I tried to work through, a very close friend, for months. Bring me your lie. He brings a lie. Of course, they, most of them were from Epic Times, a Chinese a Chinese cults uh, conspiracy website. And I found that after I disproved one thing after another, if he'd even admit to that, then another lie would pop up. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? And it just reminds me, Hitler talking about, you know, just flooding the zone with lie after lie after lie after lie after a while. People get exhausted and just give up. This is happening to people with advanced degrees. Yeah, so this is this concept, and we see it in Russia, too, with Vladimir Putin. They call it the fog of unknowability. I'm going to flood the zone with so much information that people don't know what to think. Uh, and so they check out of politics altogether. Uh, but as you said, it isn't rubes. It's plenty of smart people. But we have been convinced that we should choose tribe over truth and care more about which party is aligned with this and which is not. People don't want to change their minds because they've been told that the other side is the devil and is the radical leftist that will ruin America, you know, woke, woke culture and other things. I find that one t tactic that I talk about in the book that can be useful is to talking with people and asking about the evidence that supports their claim. Uh, you know, it isn't so much the, the facts that are out there, but what are the underlying facts that support it? What's the data uh, and what is the evidence? You know, I come from a world of courts where you can't just say things and have a jury believe it to be true. You have to show them evidence to back it up. And instead, if they're, all they're talking about is somebody said something, that, that shouldn't be sufficient. And so I think being patient, being kind with our friends, um, but also recognizing that there are people out there who are deliberately going along with the con to advance their political agenda or personal agenda or profit agenda. We saw it with Fox News when they had to pay the $700 million uh, defamation settlement to Dominion voting systems when they uh, fostered and, and, and sponsored lies about machines flipping votes from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. And so uh, we need to overcome. There's a lot of force out there for lies. But I think um, to have America means uh, a democracy that is based on truth. Uh, she's definitely looking, though, at how she did in South Carolina. And, you know, again, there were all these headlines that were like, oh, Don, you know, the breaking news, Donald Trump, a decisive, you know, you know like consolidating this, consolidating that, trouncing Nikki Haley. I mean, they're looking at this like it's 2016 and this is the first time Donald Trump has run. He is the incumbent. He's about to be the three-time incumbent for the Republican Party as far as nominations go. And he lost 40 percent. That would freak out any politician I ever served with if they had been around for, what, eight years and were still losing 40 percent of the vote in their own party, 50 percent in Iowa? Nikki Haley noticed, noted that yesterday at a rally in Michigan and pointed out that Donald Trump keeps bleeding support from a huge amount of Republican supporters. You look at those first early states. They can say Donald Trump won. I give him that. But he, as a Republican incumbent, didn't get 40% of the vote of the primary. And so the issue at hand is, he's not going to get the 40% if he's going and calling out my supporters and saying they're barred permanently from MAGA. 
He's not going to get the 40% by calling them names. He's not going to get the 40% by trying to take over the RNC so that it pays all his legal fees. He's not going to get the 40% if he is not willing to change and do something that acknowledges the 40%. And why should the 40% have to cave to him? And why is it 40%? Eugene, in part because he keeps saying asinine things. I mean, every day he's out there. He either forgets who the president of the United States is, thinks he's running against Barack Obama, thinks Nikki Haley was Speaker of the House on January the 6th, or, as Nikki Haley herself pointed out, you know, a couple of days ago saying, black people support me, they support Trump because I have a mugshot. They can relate to me. I mean, that's basically what it was. And again, you look at that, and it's not even the black voters that he's going to lose because of it. It's going to be those white swing voters in the suburbs of Atlanta, the suburbs of, of Philadelphia, of Detroit. You go on and on and on. He loses black voters, and he loses a lot of white voters and others voters. You're like, God, I can't deal with this for another four years. Yeah, because he's already lost black voters, right? He's, he, you know, he might he might get a little bit more this year, maybe, maybe because of other things, other reasons that have nothing to do with really Donald Trump. He's not going to win black voters. It is these white women in the suburbs, in the swing states that the Republicans have been worried about for a very long time, and that over and over again they have run from. Abortion does not help them in that case, right? Those women are running away from them. These kinds of things that he's saying. Also, are why the 60% like him, right? Nikki Haley's right. That 40% should be concerning. He's in this weird quasi-incumbent role, but he is still winning the primary. And that is her problem, is that she's trying to go from A to C without B, and B's the primary, right? C would be the general election. She would probably do really well in a general election based on the groups that she's been able to cobble together. But Donald Trump continues to win over and over again because the folks that like Donald Trump like the chaos. They like the kinds of things that he's saying. They want, they, they have, over and over when I talk to them, when you go to, go to rallies or you talk to people who support Donald Trump, what they'll tell you is they want to say things like that. They want to say whatever's on their mind without anyone coming back on them. And that's just not how culture or society works. And but when you look at these numbers, the concern isn't he's going to lose the primary. It's the general election, right? His team is looking at that and saying to, and it should be saying to him, sir, there are things that we need to fix, change here and fix here in the language, because in the general election, there are warning signs over and over and over again. These Republicans that are saying they're not going to vote for him in November, mm -hmm. that should be a warning sign. The amount mm -hmm. of people who are looking at that, at the things that he's saying and saying, you know what, I'm going to sit out. Because I, I'm a Republican. I can't do this again. I heard that a lot in South Carolina when I was there. People saying, I voted for him in 2016. I voted for him in 2020, but I am done. I'm not voting for him, and I'm not voting for Joe Biden. So that's what Republicans should be concerned about and worried about. And the, uh, the Trump campaign doesn't seem concerned about that, um, but they should be. Wow. I like the uh, I like it when when Eugene does the uh, the Trump advisors thing, and he he very pointedly has sir. He always starts with well, sir. That's how he that's, <laughs> yes. has to be. Because he like uh, you make sure that he gets that in there. Because Trump only likes he like, that's why how foreign <laughs> leaders address him. Also, they always call You're him right. sir. Um, Vaughn, I, my question for you is this, right? So, uh, Michigan primary tomorrow, right? Uh, Super Tuesday, uh, not there after. Uh, Donald Trump's going to be the nominee. Going to have his 1,215 uh, delegates are locked up by the middle of March. We'll see what happens with Mickey Haley. We can talk about right. that. Right. The question of Ameri the, uh, the no labels thing on a separate track. But <laughs> here's the thing Donald Trump has coming up after Super Tuesday. Uh, he's now got a court order. Uh, mm -hmm. It says he's got to pay a lot of money, almost half a billion dollars. Letitia James says, we would like to have that money now, please. And thank you. He does not have that cash on hand. He's got to figure that out because a month from now, when the court order comes due, if he doesn't pay the bill, she could walk, walk down to uh, walk over to Trump Tower or somewhere, one of the many buildings he still owns in this town and say, uh, I'm seizing this asset now, right. I'm seizing that asset now. As Trump locks up the primary and takes over the RNC, as we learned today, Ron is out, you know, 
the cash crunch is coming right after the moment of triumph is the how am I going to pay this bill? Talk to me about how, what you hear from Trump people about how they're thinking about that problem and how it intersects with their politics. It's a lot of question marks. March 25th, circle that date, circle that date. Not only is that the beginning of the hush money payment trial, but that is also the day that the civil fraud uh, penalty is due here. And I know that they are actively looking for a lender. This is going to have to be a big lender to provide Donald Trump that sort of sum of money in in the form of an appeal bond. But also potentially... A big lender and also potentially a bonkers lender. Right. right? Who wants to make that loan. Also potentially find somebody who the Trump, who Donald Trump is willing to give equity in the stake of his business. There is a lot financially on the business and corporate side of this for Donald Trump that is on the line. Forget the politics of this. And you also have to look at the fact that you're talking about legal bills. And there is an RNC resolution that has been put forward by Mississippi longtime committee man, Henry Barber, that could very well be voted on on March 7th and 8th when the RNC 168 member body gets together in Houston, Texas, March 7th and 8th, in which they would prevent the RNC from giving any money, any of their resources to pay for Donald Trump's legal bills. We have already seen over the course of the last two years more than $80 million be spent from his uh, allied super PACs to go towards his legal bills. There is a lot that he owes already, a lot that he's going to owe into the future. And so for Donald Trump, it's complicated, and his team uh, is wholly cognizant of that. And for them, it's easier to pull up and say, look, we win in South Carolina, and the voters are on side. And hey, come November, if they win, you know, they may very well be right. But in the meanwhile, this is a big nine nine months ahead of financial obligations. Hunter Biden will go before the Republican-led oversight and judiciary committees for a deposition as part of the GOP's ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Biden, focused on Hunter and his past business dealings for years in an attempt to find cause to remove the president. They have so far been unsuccessful. Now, in a new interview with Axis, Hunter says those relentless attacks have tested his resolve, among many things, to remain sober. Joining us now with more in his rare interview with President Biden's son, national political correspondent for Axios, Alex Thompson. Alex, thanks for coming on to, to share this with us. Um, so how did he actually put that into words? What did he say about his sobriety as it pertains to the attacks on him, which have been relentless, many of them unfounded, some of them incredibly humiliating, pictures of him on the House floor. I mean, I don't understand how anybody could do this to another human being, no matter what they have or have not done. Um, And yet he moves forward. How does he stay strong? Absolutely. You know, the reason I was interested in talking to him about this is it's really an extraordinary story of resolve. Think about this. Hunter Biden was in a spiral of a crack cocaine addiction, alcohol addiction. He basically got sober the day before Joe Biden's first campaign kickoff in 2019, the day before. Since then, he has essentially been completely sober. He testified to that in court. A court uh, another judge basically said that he has been tested since August. His lawyer said that he has continued to be tested. Mm-hmm. Um, and so part of the reason that he has stayed sober, beyond, I think, the love of his family, he got married, he had a, a little boy that he named after his de- you know, his, his late brother, Bo. Yeah. But other... The other thing is he sees his sobriety as related to the fate of the country. Basically, what he said is that, you know, he thinks about the consequences of failure here. Right. That maybe this is the ultimate test for a recovering addict because he knows if he relapses, it would be devastating for his dad while his dad is running for re-election and trying to keep Trump out of the Oval Office. Wow, that's Alex, a lot of pressure. Super rare interview, but also part of a shift in his team's thinking about how they should operate. Me and Betsy Woodruff Swan wrote about this last at the end of last year, where they started to say, you know what, we don't have to sit back and take it. We should go out. He should tell his story in ways like this. But there's a split in Biden world about how it's landing, right? Some people think you should be doing that punch punch when you're punched. Others are saying, don't be a distraction. Did you guys get into that more importantly? How do you think this is landing in the Biden world? I remember that story because I was very jealous. (laughs) Um, And and you know, I think the fact that he even talked to me yeah. is sort of representative of this thing. And, you know, I think there's a view within some in the Biden circle that basically any day that Hunter is in the headlines is a bad day for Joe Biden. But I think Hunter Biden basically says, 
there's no way that you can sort of drag me down and not drag my father down too. That there are some things, and we're seeing it now with some of this reckoning with uh, the five million dollar bribe that apparently seems to have been, you know, just a complete, ma you know, fabricated thing. And and with this impeachment inquiry sort of going off the rails, that you know, in some ways, this could end up be rebounding to his father's benefit if, if they can, you know, land this plan. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Go ahead, Joe. Oh, sorry. Um, Alex, hey, it's Heilman here. Um, I'm curious about the, the thing you just talked about, which is his awareness of uh, his, his dad's political people's concerns. You know, he decided to come out swinging at one point, you know, kind of like go to, to take this on uh, head on and, and, and really not try to hide from, from these things and take on his, his critics. Um, he knows he must know that there are people around his, his father who thinks that, that that is not necessarily good for his father. I, obviously, he does care about his father a lot and wants only the best for his father. Did you talk to him at all about how he reconciles that and whether it gives him any pause to be out uh, standing next to Abby Lowell, as we see here on screen, you know, being so public when he knows that uh, there is some at least some 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 questions uh, in, in his father's inner circle about whether this is the best thing for his dad's reelection? Sure, I think it, uh, it would give anyone pause because I think he is very concerned about uh, his dad's political future. And that's really the reason why we didn't hear much from Hunter Biden uh, the first two years, which is something that Eugene wrote about, which is, and really, Hunter essentially changed strategy when he hired Abby Lowell. And he really changed strategy after the plea deal unraveled last July um, and basically said that this is now a political fight. And there is, you know, even though there, there are concerns, um, my understanding is that he has his dad's blessing. And that is the only blessing that Hunter really cares about. All right. National political correspondent for Axios, Alex Thompson. Thank you so much. Great piece.